Until he's having a hard time just kicking him away. Yeah. Well, you know, I used to watch wrestling. Yes, I was a teenager. Watched wrestling back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And The Rock, every time he would come back to a, a bigger city or something, he would take the microphone and he would say, finally, he would yell, I'm not going to yell. He said, finally, The Rock has come back. Kind of reminds me of this moment right now. Finally, the Barna family has come back to the place, to the home of where I began my preaching when I was in seminary still. And what a blessing this place is. And we just want to say we are so grateful to be back here. We are, we are so blessed that you asked us to come back and be a part of it. I mean, it's such an honor, everybody. So thank you for that. Today, before we get into the main lesson, I want us, I want us to remember one thing. What do we first and foremost consider ourselves? You know, with everything that we see on the news, we see people fighting for a certain type of agenda or a certain type of mission. What is our mission? <clears throat> Whether it's our ethnicity, our job title, our politics, liberal, conservative, Republican, or Democratic, whether it's our position in whatever we're trying to do in our career, those should all be secondary. First and foremost, we must proclaim that we are Christians. And it sounds like that's simple, but it's not. So often we allow other things to creep in and take the center of our lives. Remember, one thing I would always say when I used to preach here is that God doesn't want to be on the top of a list, one, two, three. He wants to be in the center of our lives with everything that we're doing, He is a part of. He wants to be at the core of it. So whenever we're with family, when we're at work, when we're doing politics, God is in our decisions. In everything that we're a part of, God is living through us. So often these idols, even good things can be idols in our lives when we're first a father. <coughs> We first must be Christians before anything else. Let us remember that. And oh, how Christ is worthy. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our life. So, with that, today's lesson will be coming out of the, the Gospel of John, chapter 18, starting with verse 1, going through verse 8. I'll give you a moment to turn there. That is the Gospel of John. Chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And if you will, please, let's bow our heads and let's pray first and foremost. Father, at this moment in time, we come before your word, God. Your word that is truth. We are grateful for your word, Lord. For without it, we are lost. Help us to remember how beautiful, how amazing your scripture, your word that is breathed, Father, how important it is, God, that it is embedded in truth and love, not just one or the other. We thank you for this truth. May it pierce our souls, may it pierce our entire beings, Father, to become more like the image of Jesus Christ, God. Father, may the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord. May we love a life that chases after your heart. Of course, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> the writer John writes in verse 1, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kindred, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers and soldiers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Who is it that you're 
are seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. Now when he said this, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Who is it that you're seeking? And they responded, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, Have I told you that I am he? Therefore, if you seek me, let these men go, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. This is the word of God for the people of God. <coughs> God. As I kind of connected with the children's sermon this morning, a lot of times we can get misconstrued on who Jesus is and the character of Jesus, the character of God. And we can sometimes think that he is just a soft-spoken or a weaker-toned man. Oh my, 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 how wrong we can be when we think these things. And how mistaken the world is to even perceive him as being weak. You see, if you look through the Gospels, you'll see there's two tones that Jesus has with two groups of people. This past year, this has been something that God has been speaking to, speaking to me with. Notice, Jesus says things like, Do you think I have come to bring peace? No, I have come to bring division. What? Matthew 7, he says, you know, the, the Pharisees are saying, what? We have prayed in your name. We have fulfilled prophecies. We have had faith that moved mountains. And he says, I will tell them, I will turn my back away from them and say, away with you. I never, ever, ever knew you. Whoa. We read in the prodigal son, we have a son, a younger son, who is a sinful man, who goes off into a land to be sinful, and then he comes back with a repentant heart. And before he can even make it back to the house, the father goes and runs to him. But the older son, because of his unwillingness to see the gift and the grace that the father had for the fallen son, he keeps himself away from the celebration. And Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees as the older son and to the sinners as a younger son. Whenever we see Jesus talking with sternness and directness, it's always to the religious people. It's to the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He talks with directness. It's like he's slapping them in the face with words. No wonder they wanted to kill him. He was a threat. You see, Jesus is not just a good person. You don't crucify good people. You crucify threats. And oh, how he was a threat to the state of Rome and to the religious people of the day. Who is this man who forgives sins? How dare he? Who is he to heal on the Sabbath? And he says what? Man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. And every time he, he's in the midst of the sinners, or those who are being a part of the downtrodden and the outcast, blessed are they. Blessed are them, for the kingdom of God is theirs. And you know, one thing I've realized with myself is that I need these two, these two types of talking to myself. Because we are a religious people. There's nothing wrong with our, our, our religiousness. But what happens is when our religiousness trumps our relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. It is first and foremost our relationship with him. A beautiful, amazing relationship. For he is the vine and we are the branches. We are so connected to him because without him we are nothing. As Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 13, if you think that's just a chapter on love, my friend, you are mistaken. He is pointing to Jesus. Without Jesus, we are nothing. 
no matter what we do. We can give our goods to the poor, we can give our body to be burned, but if we not have love, if we not have Jesus, we are nothing. Forget about it. For now. And I see these types of ways that he talks, and there's times that I need that direct talk and that sternness from Christ. Mm, Cliff, I don't know about that. Away with you, man. That's not how we do this. It's not about that. I need you to realign yourself. I need you to repent. See, repentance is a daily thing. It is not a one-time moment in our lives. It's amazing that the first words that Jesus says after he's baptized is repent for the kingdom of God is near. I must repent. I must remember what Jesus has done at the cross, the cross that we deserve. I must redefine myself in God. I must realign. Just like a car needs a realignment to get back on track, we need that on a daily basis as well. I must be refined. <clears throat> Make no mistake about it, refination is not easy. We're told in the Old Testament, when gold is refined, it is put through the fire. <coughs> gold is how it comes out here on the other side. So let's remember that. So here in this moment, before this moment, let's talk about John 17. Jesus first prays. And this prayer, the Gospel of John, he prays for himself. He prays for the disciples, and then he prays for you, all believers. He prays for us. Amazing. And then here comes this moment where Judas has gone to the Pharisees and the religious people and betrayed Jesus. And what do they do? They gather a mob. Now, <laughs> here's Jesus, unarmed has done miracles, has not shown any physical threat, but he's shown threat in a different way. And they have to get armed. <coughs> Scripture tells us these are officers. They are soldiers. And they have lanterns, torches, and weapons. Are they going after King Kong? What is going on here? They're after a witch or something. They're thinking that there's going to be some kind of retaliation. And here comes that moment that they're coming. And Jesus, as it says in Scripture, knowing all things that was to happen to him, he goes forward. He goes forward. Now, how many times in our lives have we been in an instance where we have messed up or we have slipped Man, we don't want to take the credit. We don't want to be put in the light. And, or, if it does happen, well, so-and-so, Casey, that was your fault, too. We, we messed up as a family, but my wife was a part of this, too, y'all. <laughs> Try to reel in as many people as we can and say, oh, but them, too. Them, too. And here's Jesus. He goes forward. And notice this. They don't say, where is Jesus? Where is this man? He asks them. Isn't it amazing how Jesus always raises the question? Even when they're asking him a question, he'll raise a question back. But here he starts the conversation at this moment. It's nighttime. They have their torches lit. And he says, who is it that you seek? And they tell him, Jesus of Nazareth. Mm. And his response, y'all, is more than just three words. He says, I am he, a.k.a. I'm your puppet bear. I'm the one you're looking for, partner. Nobody else. It is I. His response was so amazing, and it was filled with magnitude. They draw back and fall to the ground. I am. Does this not sound familiar? In the Greek, it is actually not the same I am as in the Hebrew when Moses was before the burning bush. They are face to face with the great I am. Jesus proclaimed in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The great I am. And here is truth before them. And they fall before it. 
at this might and this strength of Jesus Christ. Not because of how strong he looks. Not because he called all the legion of angels down. But he comes forward. He says, I am he. They fall to the ground. And he's standing there. Jesus said, he says, maybe I have to ask you again. Well, why are you on the ground? Once again, who is it that you are seeking? And they say again, Jesus of Nazareth, they're so perplexed. And he says, have I not told you that I am he? Now, let these people go. The very ones who would deny him. The very ones who are the weakest. His disciples. The one that drew a sword and cut the ear off. He is the main one that's going to deny him three times. Aren't you with that Jesus? I've seen you with him. No, no. That is not me. As the cock crow, he denied three times. Yet Jesus still goes forward. The one that betrayed him is on the other side. And yet he still goes forward and says, I'm your huckleberry. I'm the one you're looking for. Let these people go. Let me remind you, he has done nothing wrong. He is the perfect lamb. He is the sinless lamb. And he says he knows everything he is going to take for us. He goes forward. Not just for his disciples, for us. It had to happen. We're told in the other Gospels when he's praying in the garden of the city. He says, Lord, if there is any other way, let it be. Please, let this cup pass from me. He was praying so harshly, he was bleeding from his forehead. His capillaries were bursting. There must be another way for and he ends his prayer, as we all should always end our prayer with, but God, let your will be done. He drinks the cup that is to come his way. That is the only way the cup would pass by him drinking. And he knew it. Knowing all these things, he goes forward. You know, last night, I was watching the movie Cinderella Man, the boxing movie with Russell Crowe. And he's having these, it's, it's a 1930s boxer, a story of him that he came out of poverty. Uh, he was living in poverty, and he was trying to get some fights to win so he could provide for his family, so his family didn't have to separate up in New Jersey. He boxed in the New York area. And as you're watching these fights, these men, they're like, I don't remember fighting this guy. They fought him before, but they're like, something has happened to him. Something is different about this boxer. He was fighting for something. He was motivated. You see, our habit is connected to our motivation, to our core beliefs. If you think about it, you know, dealing with discipline at a school, when dealing with students, there's habits, but there's something at the deeper perspective of that, with the core of it, the belief of why they're acting that way. There's different levels, if you will. The habits are because of emotions, emotions are because of thoughts, and thoughts are because of our beliefs. That's why Paul is always talking about renew your mind in Christ Jesus. Let him affect your thoughts so deeply to your core. And this boxer, the reason why he was a changed man and became such a great boxer and was an underdog, ended up winning the title, true story, James Bryan, look it up, was because he was fighting for his family. I love the, the way the director did the movie. Every time he would get hit in the chin, it showed flashbacks of an empty bed that his children would sleep in. Or his wife walking out the door. Or them starving out of poverty because of the Great Depression. He had something he was fighting for. I like to think, and I truly do believe this, when Jesus went forward, he saw you. He was having flashbacks of you, of us as believers. He had the motivation. The Father gave him his mission, and he obeyed. He goes forward for us. 
and we do not deserve one bit of it. But he goes forward. And that story doesn't end there. Yes, we're sinless. We don't deserve this grace. Then he conquers death. And this resurrection, the very thing we do not deserve, we deserve the cross, he takes on that, then he gives us the power of the resurrection. We don't deserve that. It's so profound what God has done. You see, how many times in our life do we need to go forward? And when I mean going forward, it's not just in the midst of people, in the midst of criticism, or when people come our way and we must stand tall, but the main thing, the core of it all, is how do we go forward with Christ Jesus towards Him? Listen, one thing we are scared of, the R word, we mentioned it earlier in the sermon, is repentance. We need to talk about this more. There's something special that Jesus said this before, after, after He was baptized. It's the first thing He proclaimed. It is a grace thing. It is not something to be scared of. Because we need it. The mere fact that God speaks to us and says, Cliff, you're veering off a little wrong here. I need you to come back my way. That is love. That is love. And when we go forward, the strongest we can be, the strongest position that we as believers can ever be is when we are in, on our knees in prayer and surrender before God. I am yours. Do with me as you wish. You have gone forward for me. I will go forward for you. I don't care how secular this world will become. And it's not about arguing. It is about testifying. I'm not trying to be right. I testify. So when people come to you with arguments, but what about this false and this, how can you tell me Jesus did this and that? Look, I'm not trying to be right. I'm letting you know I belong to him every part of me. And there's nothing you can say or do to change that. May we proclaim that in this day because we need it, brothers and sisters. Let me tell you, we need it. Do not waver left or right. <coughs> Stay down the center of the righteous path as God has told Joshua. Do not be fearful. Be filled with courage because I am with you. Emmanuel. God with us. Let us be encouraged. Let us be the light of the world. Let us be the salt of this earth. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, God, to say thank you, Lord, for the truth that you've given us through your word, God. Thank you for the love that you show in Jesus Christ, Father. Lord, in this world today, Father, may we go forward and proclaim the name of Jesus as he has gone forward for us. Lord, he is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy, God. Help us to remember that, Father. We belong to you, God. Do with us as you will. We love you with all our mind, body, and soul. God, please give us the strength and courage to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
brothers and sisters, remember, the one with an argument is always at the will of the one who testifies. Go out into this world and testify to the truth, the way and the life, our Lord Jesus Christ. Be the light and salt forever and ever. Amen. Amen.